Well, good morning, church family. Pray you're having an awesome summer as uh, the busyness continues around here at uh, First Baptist Bernie. Uh, again, just talking with Garrett this morning, hearing incredible stories of, of youth camp and, and Cairo. Uh, the, the DC trip was amazing. And so God continues to uh, bless us and God continues to use us. You guys ever pause and just think about how incredible it is that God, that God uses us uh, for his kingdom purposes? Amen. All right. This morning, we have the awesome privilege of taking the Lord's Supper together. All right. Um, if you did not grab elements on your way in, if you will lift your hand, we'll have some deacons who will pop up and we'll make sure that you have these. Um, taking the Lord's Supper is something that baptized born again believers do. Okay? And that is as a remembrance, as a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And scripture tells us, do not take this in an unworthy manner. So the entirety of the service, I just want you to be preparing your heart uh, for when we take this together at the end. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41, we're going to continue our walk through our sermon series, where we're looking at the life of Joseph, everything that he's gone through. And this morning, specifically, we're going to be looking at the way that the six years after Joseph comes out of prison, he's exalted to the number two in all of Egypt, that God begins to work out forgiveness in his heart, forgiveness in his heart. A young lady walked into my office, let's call her Kelly. Recently engaged, she told me that she lived most of her life in perpetual fear. And she wanted help, but she didn't know where to start. Over the course of the next hour, she began to unfold to me the worst case of childhood abuse that I had ever counseled. When she walked out of my office, all I could do was weep. The next time we met, it was my turn to let her know that the process would go at her pace, that we would take as long as we needed. But if she was going to get the freedom and healing that she desired, Jesus required her to forgive her abuser. Now, as I'm going to explain later, forgiveness is not forgetting or pretending it never happened. It's, it is, in fact, trusting the justice to God. Now, I'm not going to lie. It was brutal for Kelly to walk through this. There were times she wanted to quit where she did not think that she could face what had happened. But as the saying goes, forgiveness is to set the prisoner free. And then to find out the prisoner was me. Now, in the end, Kelly forgave. And she found that God's grace was sufficient for every step along the way. And then that there was freedom in Jesus Christ on the other side. Now, as we've walked through our sermon, summer sermon series, say that three times quick. We've seen that Joseph had suffered in captivity for 13 years, sold into slavery, betrayed by his brothers, ultimately might have spent five years in a dungeon. And now we will see today that on the other side, God is beginning to take him through a process of forgiveness and healing. So let's pick up chapter 41, verse 41, as I read through 46. Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold necklace around his neck. And he made him ride in a second chariot and then proclaimed before him, bow the knee. And he had set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, though I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one shall Uh, raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh named Joseph 
uh, Zaphonath, uh, Penneth, and gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, as his wife. And Joseph went forth over the land of Egypt. Now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, believing and trusting your word, that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, that your Holy Spirit will take your word because it is alive and will begin to decipher and discern the depths of our heart, that through your spirit, we are able, God, to know the deep things of our own soul and the truth of your word. We pray to that end this morning. We pray that we would not take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy fashion, but that we would welcome right now, open-handed, that your spirit would open our eyes to the truth that we would be a forgiving people, that we would keep short accounts for the glory of your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, at this time in history, Egypt is of extreme wealth, trade and commerce from all over the world. They have remarkable influence, okay? They have the highest educational achievements. They have the biggest and baddest military on the whole planet. Egypt has unparalleled, beautiful, advanced cities. The rich in Egypt live in luxurious, sprawling places. And our man, Joseph, is now number two in the whole land of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself. There's an old saying, if you see a turtle on a fence post, there's one thing you know, someone put him there. God has exalted Joseph. We followed his journey through incredible suffering and waiting, Joseph being knocked down again and again. We asked, how long, O Lord? How much lower can he get? We learned lessons of humility, how God uses trials to shape his children. Recall our lesson from last week, that God loves to exalt the humble, that once the trial has accomplished all that God has purposed it, God loves to lift up and give his children good gifts. So here the turtle sits atop the post, Joseph, the number two in all of Egypt. He's living in a palace, clothed in royal garments. He has a security detail that goes with him everywhere he goes, and they demand (coughs) that all bow the knee before him. Good or bad, he is in the spotlight, whispered about, acknowledged every time he walks in a room. What sort of slimy moves did he do to get there? He yields complete authority. He has the signet ring of Pharaoh used to stamp into law, complete authority. And he's collecting 20% of all the produce of the land as a tax and placing it in grain houses for future. Joseph is suddenly very wealthy and very powerful. Now just think for a moment of all the directions our story could go. Like the Count of Monte Cristo, Edmond Dantes, was in a similar situation to Joseph. He was betrayed and had to spend years of his life in prison. Later, he escapes and he goes back for revenge. And then he famously quotes, if you have ever loved me, do not rob me of my hate. It is all I have. See, there's great temptation for Joseph, right? To abuse his power and to go on a, how do you like me now? Revenge tour to the cupbearer, 
to Potiphar, his wife, his brothers, but we don't get a revenge tour. We're also anxious as we read, if Joseph's sudden found wealth and fame, if it changes him, as Jesus said, you cannot love both God and money. Is Joseph going to be enticed by the comforts of this world? And does his heart soon begin to love the gifts that God has given more than God himself? Is his new Egyptian name and title going to result in a story becoming similar to the future of Solomon, whose heart was enticed towards other women and to love money and other gods? As a father, God loves to give good gifts to his children. But remember when Israel was going into the promised land, God also warned Israel. Okay. It's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. And when you get in there and it has splendid cities that you didn't build and houses that are filled with stuff that you didn't put in there and vineyards (coughs) that you didn't plant and wells that you didn't dig. And when you eat and are satisfied, God says, do not forget me. Do not forget me. I am the one who gave you all these things. So of all the ways that Joseph's story could go, it doesn't. Joseph is actually an example of faithfulness in affluence. Joseph is a living example of what the apostle Paul will later write about in Philippians four verses 11 through 13. Paul says, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along in humble means and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. You see, Joseph is a perfect reminder for us to not over-spiritualize poverty and hardships. Joseph was a rich man and he loved God. And I'm sure like the apostle Paul, there was a learning process to have to deal with all that affluence and all of that power. But in the end, as his story unfolds, he walks in faithfulness. Joseph Joseph also reminds us to not disguise our own envy and jealousy of those who have the world's goods by being overly critical. What slimy thing did he do to get there? All that wealth is ungodly. As Jesus said to Peter, what is it to you how I write another man's story? Right? If God wants to bless some of his children with abundant resources, what is that to you? Is he not your portion? Furthermore, there are a good number of God's children who use their abundant resources in radical ways for the kingdom of God. And it is not your place to judge. So here's why I'm so certain of Joseph's faithfulness as he expands into his new position. Here in our section, the narrator quickly moves through six years of Joseph's life, right after he's come out of captivity. He moves quickly, but he stops to highlight something very significant. The name that Joseph gives to his twin boys. Manasseh and Ephraim. First of all, notice their Hebrew names. This signifies that all the fame and fortune hasn't gone to his head. He still walks with Yahweh. Look at verse 51 and 52. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh. 
For he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. And he named the second Ephraim. For he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. See, of all the twists and turns that our story could have taken, here is the focus. God is healing Joseph's soul. That's what he's doing. God is helping Joseph to let go of all the baggage and hurt of the past. And God is setting Joseph free from the bondage of unforgiveness. See, now that Joseph is out of captivity, now that, now that all of those 13 years is, is behind him, it's in the past, and he's no longer in survival mode, it's actually time to process what has taken place. And all the emotions and the desire for revenge and the desire for justification, all that he's walked through, that process of forgiveness now must begin. And guys, I'm convinced that at some point along the way, the Holy Spirit said something like, Joseph, you have to forgive your brothers. Bitterness is a root that will poison your soul. But they aren't here. They aren't anywhere around. This first step of forgiveness doesn't have anything to do with them. This is all between me and you. So church family, with our time remaining this morning, I would like for us to pause and to look at Jesus' commands for the Christian to forgive. Even our enemies. But before we do, I know that all across this room, many of you have deep hurts, unresolved issues. The moment that I say the word forgiveness, a particular person or situation pops up in your mind. We are going to go there today. And I'm begging you, to go there with us because Jesus offers healing and hope on the other side. So let's start where we must start, but sadly, most of us don't go any further. And that is the clear commands from scripture in Jesus. Uh, that is that, that we would love our enemies. Now, before we do, let me ask you, do you believe that Jesus' commands are for your good? Do you believe that when he commands something, even if it's hard, he's doing it for your good? Okay. Listen, Matthew 6. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not, do not forgive others, then your father will not forgive your transgressions. Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but, to, but up to 70 times seven. Matthew 5, 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. There are a number of other commands in the New Testament. Here, Jesus says, pray and love your enemies. Do not return evil for evil. In fact, to your enemies, in Luke 6, 28, Jesus says to bless them. Seek reconciliation. Revelation 12, uh, sorry, Romans 12, 18. And we are called to resist revenge. So there you go. Commands from scripture. Now go do it. Usually, sadly, that's all we get. But I want to take some time and walk through uh, a process this morning. Because most often it's so much more complicated than that, right? All right, Joseph, you're out of prison. 
just forgive. Just forget and move on. There you go. Then why is it after six years, does he name his boys such deep, meaningful names that all surround, that surround the idea of God helping him to forgive? Remember Kelly? She said to me, I don't know how to forgive. I'm stuck in the past and I do not know how to move forward. What would you say to that? So many times in counseling, I have people that's, that genuinely cannot put their finger on the hangups that are buried deep in there. And one of the things I do is I say, listen, that is a work of the Holy Spirit. And we begin to beg God for courage and strength to address the past, but also to expose the issues deep in the heart. That is a work of the Holy Spirit of God. And you wouldn't believe the number of times I, we've prayed that prayer and, and they come back and the next time and they say, you would not believe what God did this week. As they begin to see and show how the Holy Spirit allows them to put their finger But the number one problem that I've discovered when counseling Christians about forgiveness is that almost all people have a false definition of biblical forgiveness. The false definition sounds like this. Just forget it ever happened. Pretend that it didn't hurt. Okay. Uh, If I forgive them, then I'm having to say that what happened wasn't wrong. Now, let me point out to you kind of two categories of forgiveness. Did you know that you forgive people every day? Someone cuts you off in traffic. Someone steals your parking spot. All right. You don't carry that around with you forever. You choose to forgive them. You, You just do it. You understand that people are sinful and, and that, that things happen and you can't carry that stuff around. That would be way too much baggage. So there's <laughs> volitional forgiveness, deciding, choosing to forgive and forget. Now, this ability has an emotional threshold because when events occur that are deeper and more serious, closer to the heart, when the cut is so much deeper, we can't just forget and move on. Joseph can't forget that his brothers wished him dead and sold him into slavery for 13 years, 13 of his years, years of his life stolen. And many of you in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. You try to forgive and forget Because that's what the Bible says, right? But your emotional scars have you trapped. Now at the core of this issue is a great injustice was done to you. And all the emotions that are attached to that injustice, like anger and resentment, frustration, bitterness, hostility, revenge, avoidance, and fear, All of that has left an unavoidable scar. And you hear the sometimes trite scriptural admonitions from others. Just forgive and forget. Jesus wants you to and just move on. Sadly, sometimes Christians use forgiveness as a manipulation. As husbands abuse their wives and say, now you must forgive. But all of that points back to a false view of forgiveness. Listen to me. Biblical forgiveness does not pretend that the offense never occurred. God never works that way. And that's not how he forgave your sin. No, no, no. With your sin, he looked at it and then he sent his son and then his son paid for it on the cross. That's how biblical forgiveness works. Sin is stared straight at in all of its ugliness, in all of its heinous, 
okay? Stared straight at it. And Jesus died for it. So God will never ask you to pretend it never happened. In fact, it's just the opposite. When I'm counseling someone, I ask them to express and recall their deep hurts and the emotions to feel the injustice. Do not pretend that it didn't hurt. And then I ask them, what does God think of that sort of injustice? No one hates sin more than God. And no one hates what was done to you more than God. Right? Joseph, what what your brothers did was evil and wrong. You don't have to pretend that it was okay or that it didn't hurt. God knows your pain. God knows your anger and your fear and that you can't sleep at night. He knows. There may be no one else on earth who understands the depth of your pain, but he does. The Bible says that his thoughts towards you outnumber the sand on the shore. And God sent his son to meet you right where you are. But here's the problem. During that offense, because a great injustice occurred, whether you know it or not, you find yourself sitting in the wrong seat. You have crept up into the judgment seat. And you can't handle being in that seat. Look at how long you've been up there. And you've only grown more bitter and more angry. You want justice. You want them to feel what you have felt and how they have hurt you. You want them to know what they have taken from you. But can I ask you, has it worked so far? And even if they do have pain, will it ever undo the pain that you've experienced? Can I show you the only path forward? The only path forward is to face the injustice, to call it exactly what it is. Sin it was vile. It was awful. To understand that God knows and God too hates the injustice. And then the next thing that you need to do is you need to bag it all up. You need to give it to the Lord and you need to come down from that judgment seat. You need to say, you know what? I can't handle it. And it's not my job in the first place. God, I trust you to deal with them. I trust you to bring about justice It's been too big for me. I am ready to let it go. And I want the freedom of choosing to love my enemy. See, the first step of forgiveness, as Archibald Hart put it, surrendering my right to hurt you for hurting me. Guys, this is how you get there. All the commands from Jesus, right? Pray and love your enemies. Do not return evil for evil. Bless them. Seek reconciliation. Resist revenge. This is how you get there. Again, I want you to notice how this does not involve the other person. The first step of forgiveness is one-sided. That is that you would love your enemy. Now we're going to get to the part where Joseph interacts with his brothers and trust is built over time and what reconciliation looks like. But this is where we are Today, This is where we are this morning. And this is where Joseph is. That after six years of coming out of prison, God worked on him to the point where he can genuinely say, God caused me to forget my affliction. 
And he allowed me to move past my past and make me fruitful. And he blessed me on the other side. Now, I want you to move in your heart and your mind towards the Lord's Supper. And I want you to prepare the bread. I want you to hold it. I want us to take this together. But beloved, let's, let's go back to the most, one of the most important parts of this sermon, right? And that was God stared directly at your sin. Okay. This is biblical forgiveness. He stared directly at your sin. You forget so many of your sins. God sees it all. You justify so many of your sins. God is holy and perfect. And the truth of the gospel is God stared directly at your sin and gave his son for you, gave his son for you. So I want to give you just a few moments, have an intimate time with your Lord and savior, confess whatever sins the spirit of God brings to your mind, lay them at the foot of the cross and know that his body was broken for you. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it. He gave it to the disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body. Now, as you prepare the cup, remembering the cup represents the blood of his covenant. It represents that, that your sins, my friend, have been paid for in full and that there is victory on the other side. That he, he washes you white as snow, completely forgiven. And then he calls us to life. There are many of us here this morning that that know that there is a step of obedience that you need to take. Jesus is calling you to life. He's calling you to freedom on the other side. He's done all the work to forgive your sin. But there's a process for you to walk out in obedience. So I'm going to give you just a few moments before we take this together. As we celebrate the freedom and the victory, there's also obedience that comes with following our Lord. You do business with him and then we will drink together.
And then Jesus took a cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, there is no God like you. There is no God who has given his son and understands and has entered into our suffering, our temptation, our trials, who understands our weaknesses. King Jesus, you, you are our advocate. You are our friend. You are our mediator. You are our all in all. There is no one like you. Thank you for the forgiveness, for the forgiveness of the cross, for reconciling us to your father so that we can know you, so that we can walk with you, so that we can abide in you. Father, give us strength all across this room, disciples of yours, to walk in obedience, to do things that are hard because we believe and we trust that you desire our best and that you desire to set us free from the bondage of unforgiveness. Holy Spirit, have your way in your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.